bizarre, sabotage, blackmail, and enough. The president expressed outrage that one faction in one House of Congress is ready to bring the entire federal government to a halt. Lawmakers here in Washington are working around the clock to pass a massive funding bill to keep the government open through the fall. Congress is expected to pass a huge omnibus spending bill, they call it, $410 billion to fund the federal government. Tonight, lawmakers racing to prevent a government shutdown. Both chambers needing to vote to extend funding by midnight Thursday. Congress is one step closer to passing a $1.3 trillion federal spending bill. It's ahead of a Friday deadline, and just moments ago, the House voted for the plan. And here is our shutdown clock, counting towards midnight. There is no question that Congress operates differently today than it did in what we used to call the textbook Congress, the Congress of the 1960s and 1970s. This was an inclusive process where a lot of members had an opportunity to have uh, input and to have their say on the floor. Over the decades and centuries, Congress developed a system of committees and then subcommittees within that. And those subcommittees are charged with gathering the facts, the information about what the legislation should look like and how much spending there should be, and oversight on is the spending being done correctly. The pros of regular order are deliberation and representation. The big con is that it just doesn't function under contemporary conditions. What we've seen in recent decades has been a steady centralization of the process, legislation literally just coming straight out of leadership offices and going to the floor. The top-down system like we have with Omnibus puts a few politicians, basically the party leadership, in charge of designing what the budget resolution looks like. They get to say what's going to happen. Since about 2000, in the Senate and in the House, Leadership in both parties have brought the control over the substance of legislation into their office and then told the committees what the bill should look like. You avoid all of this back and forth vote trading that you get your thing in exchange for me getting my thing. You separate the decision makers, the party elite, from the whims of the voters. And the whole budget process moves along much more quickly because there are fewer decision makers. These are all the virtues of an omnibus system. And the omnibus system, in turn, empowers the two major parties much more than they would have been empowered otherwise. You'd probably be hard pressed to find a member of Congress who would praise these approaches as how they want to do business. But it's a matter of either accomplishing their goals or not accomplishing them. And so why they are departing from regular order processes is because it's a way to make the system function when its natural state is gridlock. But here's the Achilles heel. That system yields excellent outcomes only if the party leadership are excellent people. If they are trying to do right by their constituents and by the principles that they hold, the contentiousness make it very difficult to put legislation through a regular order process. You know, you're looking at a Congress uh, which has for decades been perched on a knife's edge where either party could win power in the next elections. This creates a risk aversion on the part of members who don't want to do anything to harm their party's chances of either winning or retaining control of Congress. In 1997, we got a balanced budget with Bill Clinton and historically balanced the budget for the first time in decades. And frankly, we haven't been able to achieve that since then in our country. Uh, so that taught me you need to have a mandate from the American people to put a lid on spending and control the spending. But I quickly found out that folks on our own team weren't really with the game plan. Members are choosing the processes that work in an environment where the old processes don't work. Having a system in which there are many committees with many different politicians approving different parts of the budget. If your goal is simply to get the budget through as quickly as possible, then this is a bad idea to have all of these politicians and all these committees involved. Basically, Congress has resorted to passing the bulk of its legislation in these big omnibus packages. So a, a whole Congress's worth of legislation gets rolled into just a few bills. 
All the major COVID aid packages were negotiated behind the scenes in leadership offices. The CARES Act in March of 2020, it's a $2.2 trillion bill. We've never seen legislation with that much money at stake in a single bill, and yet voted on without opportunities for members to amend. It was a take it or leave it vote that's completely at odds with congressional history. Now, the whole thing might move along more quickly, uh, it might be more orderly, there's less horse trading perhaps that's going on, but notice something interesting. There's an important party who's left out of the discussion, and that's the taxpayer. There's a, about an $80 billion increase in defense spending, uh, roughly $60 billion, $63 billion increase in domestic spending. That's a victory for everyone. Republicans were looking for a big increase. This is the largest in several cycles, and it's also a significant increase in domestic spending. Tucked inside the 1,603-page spending bill, a slew of holiday bonuses for special interests. I don't think there's a clear-cut answer to the question of which process is more uh, open to corruption. Like a very open and transparent regular order process provides a lot of opportunity for special interests to request that they be fine-tuned in ways they would like to see. On the other hand, one always worries about those big packages and how many measures that couldn't pass on their own can pass as part of these bigger packages. When you move things to the leadership, it deprives each member of their constitutional responsibility to represent their district or their state. I believe that's very anti-democratic. If the taxpayers become annoyed that the budget has all sorts of pork in it, and this is gonna come back to the taxpayer in the form of higher taxes, they're gonna complain. But who are they gonna complain to? It's not gonna be the party leadership that designed the budget resolution. It's gonna be their individual congressmen and senators who weren't a party to the process to begin with. And so the taxpayers now have even less ability to fight back. Under current conditions where the partisan stakes are so high and there's so much uncertainty about which party will be in power, members think first and foremost about their partisan interests. If elections could just sort of settle some things for a little while, where the American people seem to have spoken as to which direction they want to go, I think that might change some of the incentives and members might begin to think more about the Congress as opposed to my party. When you concentrate power, it breaks down our constitutional system of separation of powers. Congress is a lot less effective at using the power of the purse today and therefore they delegate power to unelected regulatory agencies, to the executive, to make key decisions because Congress itself can't function well. And as a result, being a dysfunctional body, the American people lose out. The people ultimately who are making the decisions about all sorts of policies that affect our lives are so far removed from the voters that the government no longer becomes a government of the people. It becomes a government of the bureaucracy. I would like to see members of Congress care about defending the interests of Congress, regardless of partisanship, more than they do. What we have is a political system that forces compromise all the time. And I'd say that is a good feature that helps to create buy-in. You don't have half the country feeling that it's completely shut out of power. You don't want a political system that rises or falls based on the character of a few people who are in certain positions. That's a recipe for disaster. What we want is a robust system that will persist, that will do its job for better or worse, regardless of the type of people who are there. And that's not the omnibus system. That's the committee system. And to understand the changes in the legislative process, we have to set Congress in context. A political system where it's difficult to say at any given point in time who governs, who controls the state. It's always divided. It's critical that we restore a process that works in order to preserve the democratic function of spending should come from the body that's closest to the people that are having to pay for it. That principle was embedded in our Constitution. Leaders would very much like to be able just to let the committees work it out and then put legislation on the floor that can pass and that the president can sign. That would be their first preference. Committee chairs 
look to the leaders to help them get out of these impasses. I think what we really need is some leadership that can put together a genuine majority in the country. Not a majority where you know, some kind of autocracy get created out of it, but just a majority that represents what Americans want to see in public policy and can hold on to that majority for more than just a Congress or two.